This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum, bringing you Episode 20 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. Westford uh, Wardsman Newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading The Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, May 16th, 1908. And I will add context as we read along to elaborate on what was happening in Westford 113 years ago. The May 16th, 1908 issue starts with the center, Westford Center section. The will of Mrs. Augusta Butterfield, who recently died in Ayer, leaves numerous bequests for various benevolences. Among these, to the Union Congregational Church in Westford, of which she was a member, comes a legacy of $300. I might mention that Butterfield was a pretty common name in Westford in the 18th and 19th centuries. Susan Augusta Fletcher Butterfield, mentioned here, was the granddaughter of Samuel Richardson, who built the house at 120 Lowell, 120 Lowell Road in 1783, where Augusta was born. Augusta's mother... Anna, uh, spelled A-N-A, and she went by the nickname Amy. Uh, Amy Richardson married Levi T. Fletcher in 1825 when she was 20 years old, and Levi Fletcher eventually took over the farm. The house at 120 Lowell Road is referred to as both the Samuel Richardson house and the Levi T. Fletcher house, and it still is in uh, active use. Miss Clara Smith and Miss Caroline E. Hewitt have been spending a few days with Miss Emily Fletcher. Mrs. C.P. Marshall and daughter Marion have been spending the week with relatives in North Weymouth. She's uh, the wife of the pastor of the Congregational Church on Lincoln Street. Hiram Dane has returned to his home in North Westford after his winter sojourn in California. He seems pleased with his traveling experiences and also pleased to be at home once more. Hiram Dane was a Civil War veteran and would eventually move to California, where he died in 1932, aged 95. Reverend Charles P. Marshall, Mrs. the Mrs. Carey, S. and Lillian B. Atwood have been attending the annual meeting of the American Home Missionary Society held at Pittsfield this week. Miss Rebecca Elizabeth Luce, accompanied by her nephew, James Kimball, has enjoyed a visit to Marion. This was the birthplace on May 14, 1799, of her father, the late Reverend Leonard Luce who was the first pastor of the Congregational Church in Westford after it split off from First Parish Church in 1828. The next section is the Grange section. It was to be regretted that the heavy downpour of rain last week Thursday evening necessarily kept some, especially those living at a distance, from attending the first regular Grange meeting for May, About 70 patrons made the best of weather conditions and found it quite worth worth their while. At the business session, after presenting both sides, the members voted not to take charge of the Memorial Day dinner, as had been suggested, feeling that the various feasts within the order during the year and taking charge of the big Farmers Institute dinner was was being sufficiently active in this direction. A vote of thanks was extended to W.M. Wright, past master, for his efficient drilling of the ladies' degree staff and for the beautiful flowers he so generously presented to the staff. While the mood of thankfulness was becomingly bestowed upon them, a vote of thanks was extended to the overseer, Alonzo H. Sutherland, for his excellent fitting up of the closet of paraphernalia. The lecturer presented a fine program, the first number of which was a surpliced chorus of male voices in an Easter anthem. Arthur H. Kluwer, that's spelled C-L-U-E-R, of Lowell gave an enlightening talk on the workings of North Middlesex Cooperative Association, of which he is president. Many questions were asked and answered, so the members clearly understood about the organization. After this, Miss S. Ella Southland of Athol, special deputy in the Massachusetts State Grange, was introduced and gave an address entitled, quote, You and I, end quote, 
which held the closest attention of every one of her hearers. Mrs. Southland is well known in grain circles, having held various important offices, and as a speaker and reader possesses much charm and ability, offset with much common sense. Her message on this evening was a sweet sermon, without being a bit preachy, filled with the gospel of human kindness as related to our lives in the home, the Grange, and the community. At the close of this address, the Grange Orchestra gave some selections. The organization feels thankful to have this fine orchestra within its membership. Those who compose it are Mabel Miller, piano, Everett Miller, violin, Arthur Blodgett, cornet, Willard Fletcher, first clarinet, and Oscar A. Nelson, second clarinet. Mrs. Southland was then called upon and by special request recited The Husking and responded graciously to numerous encores. Uh, the Husking referred to here may be one of two poems. Walter Clark Nichols, who was born in 1870 and died in 1896 at the young age of 26, was a 19, 1893 graduate of Harvard, and he, he wrote a poem entitled Husking Time. It begins, Through many a rift and gleaming crack, the country barn so old and black by the autumn breeze is fanned. The dark red sun and the west drops low. To their nests on the rafters the swallows go, and the old barn really seems to know that the husking time's at hand. And that goes on for several more stanzas. There's also a poem uh, written by John Greenleaf Whittier, who, uh, who was born in 1807 and died in 1892. He wrote a rather long poem called Mabel Martin, A Harvest Idol, I-D-Y-L, originally written in 1857 and enlarged in 1875. Section two of that film, or poem rather, is called The Husking. It begins, it was the pleasant harvest time when cellar bins are closely stowed and garrets bend beneath their load. Uh, and it goes on for several more stanzas also. What, which, which of these, or possibly even another one, was read in 1908? Uh, we cannot tell from what's given here. The next meeting will be an open meeting, and the members of the Veterans Association will be special guests. It will be a patriotic meeting and full of interest. Of course, uh, that would be Memorial Day that's coming up. About Town is the next session. Joseph Bowers of Lowell, who had a cottage burned at Burgess Pond a few months since, is building on the north shore of Namnasset Pond the largest and most expensive summer residence in that locality, as well as the only slate-roofed building. The assessors were right close on the trail of it, following the sound of the hammer, which had not driven many nails the first day of May. Consequently, a motion to lay the consideration of, tax, of taxation on the table for a year was unanim, unanimously considered and passed. Two large summer cottages have been completed at Long Sought For Pond, one on land of Matthew F. Downs, who lived at the Old Brick Tavern at 266 Groton Road, and the other on land of Mary E. Courtney of Lowell. Arthur T. Warren of Chelmsford has purchased a large tract of wood and timber between Graniteville and Westford Station on the north side of Stony Brook Track and will commence cutting soon. It is estimated that about 150,000 feet of lumber on the lot will be hauled to the mill at Westford Station. The Simric, that's the name of a, a, a ocean liner, the Simric of the White Star Line arrived safely at Queenstown on Thursday of last week after a nine days voyage. Among the passengers were Donald Cameron and family, Mrs. Fisk, Miss Martha J. Taylor, and Horace Bacon. This party will remain abroad about three months. The Simric of about 13,000 tons was built by Harland and Wolfe in Belfast and left on its maiden voyage from Liverpool to New York on February 11, 1898. She made regular trips between these two ports until 1904 when she started sailing between Liverpool and Boston. She was also used as a troop ship during the Boer War in 1902 and during World War I. 
Simric was struck by three torpedoes from the German U-boat U-20 on May 8, 1916, and sank 28 hours later with the loss of five lives. The U-20 was the same U-boat that had sunk the Lusitania May 7, 1915. Business at the quarry of H.E. Fletcher and Company is good, with a large order from the quarry at Conway, New Hampshire, of pink, pink granite, which is taken to the quarry at Westford for cutting. This will employ nearly the, nearly the full force of stone cutters. George A. Cook, auctioneer, will sell by auction on Saturday, May 23rd at 1 o'clock p.m. all the household furniture and personal property belonging to Mary O. Blood of Westford. The next section is uh, entitled Baseball. The Westford Athletic Association began its third year last Saturday afternoon when it defeated the strong and semi-professional team from Littleton by a score of 1-0 to zero after 16 innings, which lasted three hours. It is rarely that the Westford team falls in with quite so even a match for them. It is clearly evident that they are of the material that has to be closely reckoned with, it is also exceptionally rare that non-professional teams play such an even, evenly matched game as 16 innings with only one run. This Saturday afternoon, the Westford team will endeavor to maintain their popular prestige and will meet at the park near Westford Station, the Loyal Council No. 8 Royal Arcanum from Lowell. It requires no profit to tell, foretell that there will be no repetition of one to nothing. Eddie Vaughn, who was such a star player for the Westford team last year, will play with the long-named team from Lowell. The funeral of Edmund Barton, who died last week Friday at his home on the Providence Road, took place Sunday afternoon. Reverend Charles P. Marshall was the officiating clergyman, whose condensed brevity and wise survey of the occasion was commendable. Appropriate singing added to the reflections of the occasion, which, by, which was by Mrs. C.D. Colburn, Miss Lillian Atwood, and Miss Carrie Atwood, Atwood, who sang Nearer My God to Thee and Lead Kindly Light. The bearers were A.B. Eastman, Augustus Bunce, John Grieg, and Frank Bannister. Bur burial was in Fairview Cemetery. Mr. Barton had been in feeble health for several years. He was born in England and was 71 years old. He preferred the quiet of fireside life to any noticeable association with public affairs. The next section is called the Liquor Outlook. It is now two months since the town voted itself into the liquor business, but so far business has not been rushing. Of the two applications, one got turned down by the selectmen at the location at the corner of Main and River Streets, owned by Albert Reeves. The application of Lewis Palmer on Main Street was granted by the selectmen, but Mr. Palmer, after reflecting on the $1,500 clause in the license, concluded not to unveil himself of the allurements of the business. Consequently, the town is without any legal liquor. Now, who will come to the rescue? Well, one, uh, Mr. W. Moore of Ayer, has signified to the selectmen his willingness to relieve all distresses arising from a lack of moisture of the kind that the town voted. Mr. Moore's application designa designates doing business at the King's Place, owned by John Edwards on Central Street, Ford's Village. There is little doubt that the application will be granted and the village will have more to drink. The next section is the Graniteville section. A meeting of the local branch of the Sons of Veterans was held in Music Hall last Saturday evening at 8 o'clock. The meeting was called to order by William O. Stiles, who was made temporary chairman. It was voted that the Sons of Veterans participate in the parade with the members of the Westford Veterans Association on Memorial Day, and another meeting will be held shortly in order to make the necessary arrangements. We'll talk a little bit more by, about uh, why this change was made uh, next week, I believe. The Ladies' Aid Society of the Methodist Church met with Mrs. Wesley O. Hawks Thursday afternoon. 
The many sports from this village who attended the Westford Littleton ball game at Stony Brook Park last Saturday afternoon were well repaid for their long walk by witnessing a hard fought 16 inning game that Westford won one to nothing. Joseph Butler, the Westford pitcher, was in his old time form and gave the length uh, gave the laugh to the critics that predicted that his speed would not last for nine innings. He was ably supported by Burke behind the bat, who caught in faultless style. Oscar A. Nelson of this village has been recently appointed signboard inspector for the town of Westford and took charge of his new duties last week. The next section is called Improvements. The county commissioners held a meeting at the Boston and Main Station here on Friday morning of last week at 1030 for the purpose of giving the voters and the property owners of Graniteville a chance to express their opinion in regard to the proposed improvement of Broadway from Conter's Bridge, uh, so-called, to the Mill Dam. Uh, Conter's Bridge was actually on uh, Graniteville Road, actually, it, r- it runs over the railroad tracks just be get, just before you get to Broadway. The commissioners presented plans of the proposed change, and after the question was fully discussed, the meeting closed in due order. The commissioners, with County Engineer Kendall, then took a view of said Broadway and informed the property owners that another meeting would be held in the near future when more details of the proposed change would be presented. It is the general opinion here that this particular street is very much in need of improvement, but the property owners along the line do not feel that they can give up from two to six feet of their land in order to sanction such a change. In the meantime, nothing will be done until after the next meeting of the county commissioners. The next uh, section is Forge Village. Thomas Kelly of Lowell has, in, has engaged the Hanley Cottage for this season and is now occupy, occupying it. And then the next couple paragraphs are entitled Death. William Wiggum, W-H-I-G-H-A-M, an old and respected citizen of this village, passed away Sunday evening after a short illness with pneumonia. Mr. Wiggum came from Scotland to Maine about 27 years ago, and from there he came to this village. His wife was buried just 15 years ago on the same day of the month that he died. One boy died some years ago. He leaves four sons and four daughters and 21 grandchildren. Funeral services were held at the house Wednesday afternoon. The house was filled with neighbors and friends showing their respect for him who so lately was with us seemingly in the best of health and sympathy for those who are left to mourn his loss. The beautiful Episcopal service was used at the funeral as, at the funeral, and members of the choir sang Rock of Ages, They Will Be Done, and Abide With Me. The floral offerings were many and very beautiful. The Paving Cutters Union was represented, they marching before the hearse in a body. Three Paving Cutters and three Odd Fellows were the bearers. That's the news in Westford for the week ending May 16, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions from the wardsman at the Westford Historical Society website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.